Hi, hello everybody and welcome to our 19th Open Clock Club and um, hope wherever you are in the world you're having a good weekend. Uh, if you've got the Easter weekend off on holiday then good for you, it's been a tough winter and if like us here at Open Clock Club and How to Repair Pendulum Clocks we're kind of um, keeping going the whole weekend then you are not alone. So um, particular warm welcome to new members. Rem remember back all those uh, months ago when we started this thing, it was really a support group for people who bought our book. So extra special thank you as always to people who bought the book, but we are, um, we are committed to being free to attend and open to all. On that uh, basis, uh, super special thank you to everybody on the Facebook group um, who has been helping and supporting this week. And um, it's been uh, maybe a little bit of a rough ride in places. And so I just thought it was worth reminding ourselves and reminding me why we're here. And we're here to build a community to exchange uh, views and information and posts about tools and let us know what projects you're doing. So if you're not a member of the Facebook group, then please, you're very welcome to join. If you've got clock, pendulum clock repair projects ongoing, particularly the Smiths Enfield, but anything we're interested, we're here to help. And um, thank you to all those people who've chipped in during the week, real stalwarts there with uh, support and advice basically to, to help with our community of um, clock repairers. So that's, um, that's all good. We have got a couple of projects to catch up on tonight. And I realized that we have got a bit of ahead of ourselves in terms of um, getting away from some basics. So maybe next week, if we get our rogue tooth or teeth sorted out uh, today, then uh, we'll go back to some, uh, maybe have another tool week next week. I don't know, what do you think? As always, remember these sessions are recorded and they will go on our archive, which is the, light, um, the um, yeah, How to Repair Pendulum Clocks archive. So if you want to remain anonymous, then please keep your camera turned off. But otherwise, 50% of the joy, if you like, of these sessions is the live chat. In fact, probably 98% of the joys are live chat. I just don't get to see it until it's finished. So please say hi to Team Open Clock Club here and we will try and say hi back. Let us know where you are and let us know, as always, what the weather's doing where you are and how you're getting on. So um, there's the first question for you in the live chat. What do we wanna see next week? given that we get our um, two projects finished this week. Um, we've done tool weeks in the past. Maybe we, it's time for another tool giveaway. Yeah, in, in earlier weeks, we sent tools out all over the world that we uh, uh, rather rashly give away. Uh, maybe we could do that again, I don't know. Um, or whatever you want. Anyway, let us, let us know in the live chat. So um, let's crack on with it. We've, um, there are, as I get, uh, well, I would like to say older and wiser, but it's just older, basically, in this uh, g game of horology, there are two or three uh, areas of interest, areas of practice, more importantly, that we just come back to time and time and time and time again, which is absolutely great. Now, one of those areas of practice is cleaning and that's cropped up this week on Facebook and no doubt on the many other fora around the world on clock repairing, it crops up the whole time. So uh, if you wanna know what we think about cleaning, then it's in our book. There are some sample chapters, I think on our website and you can get the book on Kindle and you can buy it uh, in hard copy uh, here in Europe. Uh, but nevertheless, we're happy to talk about that here as well. We adopt a pretty, what we like to think is a conservative approach to cleaning. And the other thing that crops up the whole time, well, two things. One is pivot polishing, which we're going to get on to in a minute. And the next thing is bushing and depthing. You, those of you that have been here before 
will know that we've talked about bushing and depthing quite extensively. So it's maybe a good idea to go back through the archive and, uh, and uh, watch those videos again. But basically, uh, John and I, John's here joining us today. Hi, John. Um, have written uh, some chapters about bushing and depthing. We hope they're going to be really useful. We've made uh, rather slow, well, we haven't made slow progress. It just turned out to be a massive job. But those things are at the printers at the moment, getting layout done. So uh, we're keeping our fingers crossed for any day or week soon on that. But the uh, basic uh, answer for bushing and depthing is that bushing is a process to um, return or move mobiles, meshing mobiles to optimal or more optimal depthing. That's what bushing is. Uh, it's, it's no more complicated or easy than that, really. So what we've advised over the weeks and months is only do bushing if there's a depthing problem. And we looked at depthing, we had a little plywood model and things, and we're gonna get our depthing tool out again today. So that's kind of quite cool. But another thing that comes out of that is the fact that we often see what we think, we're kind of programmed to consider to be other people's bad work or ugly work or stuff like that. And I'm obviously not here to, uh, to tell people what to think about that, other than from my sort of practice perspective, I really don't care so much about what other people have done in the past. I kind of have to shrug my shoulders. I'm much more interested in what we're going to do. And if you, uh, and, and therefore old repairs tend to be pretty valid unless they're causing an actual problem to the clock, like a mechanical problem that's gonna cause physical damage you know, damage to property or damage to people. So more of that later, because here we've got our 30 hour long case clock, which has got about every different kind of bushing you can imagine. So we'll, we'll come back to that later. But the pain we had last week, or I had last week over this pivot, hopefully has come to an end. You will be delighted to know we're not gonna do any more work on the pivot because I think it's done. So lessons learned. Uh, for those of you that weren't here last week, uh, this or the week before, in fact, this arbor here is out of one of our beloved Smith Senfield uh, mantle clocks. Timepiece are striking. They're both the same uh, going train pretty much. So the pivot was 0.7 millimeters and I tried to straighten it and it snapped off, which is always the, the risk of snapping it off if you try and straighten a pivot. So first lesson, don't bend the pivot in the first place, which is obviously easier said than done. The, um, the next problem uh, that I developed for myself was that I was rather um, pig headed and decided to make a drill to drill out the arbor. And I wanted to do it by using the same wire, blue pivot steel that I made the pivot from, which looking back, was uh, probably a bit of a challenge. It was too much of a challenge for me because I basically drilled out the hole and I was again a bit bloody minded doing it live on screen. I didn't temper the drill that I'd made. It probably chipped the hole therefore and the step in it and so on and so forth. And the pivot that I tried to fit in fell out twice. So that was last week. So this week I made another drill, which is here. Uh, I'll just offer it up to the... Is it here? Oh, yes, there. So I made another drill, but this time I was slightly more sensible and I made it out of one millimeter stock. So we're going to fit, um, I, and I don't know why I didn't do this the first time, because there's plenty meat here on this arbor. It's not that we're short of material. Sometimes the arbor diameter isn't a whole lot more than the pivot diameter. So you've got to really kind of keep it neat. Um, anyway, so I, I made a drill um, and this time when I'd hardened the drill, there's a video of it on the YouTube channel, I tempered it back by heating very gently with my spirit lamp till it was straw coloured, so that's like pale brown coloured, and of course it didn't chip, it drilled out the hole fine, and then I put a one millimetre pivot in the hole, no glue, no solder, I drilled about three times. People often ask, how deep do you drill in relation to pivot diameter? And of course, 
the answer to that is within reason, as deep as you can, the longer the pivot that's in the hole, kind of to a degree, the better. So I drilled about three times pivot diameter a pivot diameter or drill diameter in this case. So I drilled in three millimeters for one millimeter diameter. You could probably get away with less than that if your drill, your hole is nice and parallel. But as you saw last week, mine was all over the place and it was uh, it didn't work out. So put a one millimeter bit of blued steel in and turned it down. Now I've been using for the, again, slightly going over what we did last week, but I've been using both carbide and blued pivot steel for turning. So again, just to um, catch up, we have uh, this graver here, which I made, I can't remember whether I made that live on screen or not, but it's a bit of blue pivot steel. So it's a carbon steel. And on one end, it's got a kind of three cornered uh, pyramid shaped uh, graver, which is really useful. And on the other end, it's got a sort of semi, um, uh, an elliptical one. I'm trying to remember my uh, conic sections there. Ellipse, isn't it? I think, yes, it is. Uh, really useful thing. I also have been experimenting with some relatively inexpensive pyramid shaped carbide engraving cutters. And these are really good. And I don't know whether it's the grade of carbide. It probably is. I should probably stop cheaping out and buy some slightly more expensive ones. But the edge of this graver with the diamond sharpening stuff I've got, you can never really get it to be a nice sharp edge. It's always chipped. So it cuts like crazy, really, really, really good for removing material quickly, but leaving a poor finish. And obviously all carbide tooling isn't like that. So I'm uh, doing something wrong. So if any of you uh, people are in the uh, machine turning industry or have got more experience, then if you let us know in the live chat where we're going wrong, great for removing material, but relatively poor surface finish. Um, here's another uh, carbide graver, which was made for me by a friend. And as I said last week, you can just see here for turning the pivot that I've, you can just see it there, look, blunted one corner. So when I've been turning up to the uh, shoulder like this, can't really see, but it hasn't been cutting into the shoulder. Again, three weeks ago, two weeks ago, I think I really wanted to um, preserve the turning marks that had been made when this arbor was made. And I've failed in that as well. I've had to turn a little bit of the shoulder away. So that results in uh, extra end shake. And again, we are often interested in how much end shake an arbor has got. So lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of learning here for, for me in this process. But um, I'll just go with my phone onto my pictures and show you a little video. Can you see that? Play it again. So I, when, I, one, when I drilled out with a one millimeter drill, everything was great, nice and concentric. And whoever it was last week that said, Matthew, why don't you cut the pivot off first before you just tap it into the hole? Thank you very much, because that's what I did this time. And it was a thousand times uh, easier. So I've finished down the, uh, the pivot on the other end of the arbor is about 0 0.7, 0 0.71 millimeter diameter. Uh, so I've finished down to about 0 0.72 or something like that. Um, and then to put the final kind of uh, finish on the pivot, you can see here, I'm not messing about this week with a close up camera because it's such a faff. Uh, and you, we can always look back last week. Um, that I'm quite happy with that finish. And that finish I made with, um, I tried three things. I tried first good old um, Arkansas stone. We talked about uh, abrasive stones a few weeks ago. So this is what I tried for finishing the pivot and it worked really well. The restriction of this, and I suppose you could sharpen it on a diamond uh, stone or something, is that the corner I found wasn't particularly sharp. So the problem was that when I was uh, improving, I, I don't say polishing because it's not polishing, it's fine grinding, I suppose, abra abrading. Uh, the, it wasn't sharpening the corner out properly uh, or good enough. 
So I moved on to our good old friend, the uh, Degusit stone, or uh, however it's pronounced, which is uh, a ruby, basically. It's a synthetic uh, ruby sort of composite that's all squidged together, no doubt under a lot of heat and pressure. Uh, and again, the, I found the problem with this is it's difficult to see where you're working with the stone because it's quite dark red. So my third kind of um, experiment was with this ceramic stone by Spider Co, which I think is an American company. And it's uh, very fine. And the beauty of this is it's white, which is like, uh, you know, great because you can see exactly where the pivot's touching. And I think the finish from this is good enough. It's definitely a lot better than the other end of the pivot and the other pivots in this clock. And as I said, I'm not personally, uh, in terms of my practice, interested one bit in improving things. I'm pretty happy to sit back and look at the clock as it is and say, well, what does that mean to me? So a bit of um, hog, hog spit on there for lubrication. And you can see, I won't finish it too much because it's already kind of down to size. Well, you can see there that it's, good because you can see where you've been. So for me, um, again, let us know in the live chat what you think of these stones, but I think this is a fine enough finish for the final finish here. Now I know what you're all saying or asking is why Matthew don't you use the pivot file? Um, and as you know, I'm kind of paranoid obsessed about pivot files, but we've got some questions that come in on the live chat. So how much does the German flux cost in the UK? Oh, the, um, the, the Clemsia clamps. This is something that came up on Facebook. Sorry, nothing to do with this thing, but this is the joy of these sessions. Oh, and by the way, sorry about the backlight. Um, we're going to move around 180 degrees next week. Uh, so it's nice to see the street outside, but it's got so beautiful and sunny that um, we've, we've got a kind of backlit situation. So... Of course, the, the answer is how much are these clamps? I was using these clamps for... Christmas clock. Oh, yeah. Uh, clock. Yeah, for the um, so-called terrible clock during the week. And uh, I put them on Facebook. So they're a cam clamp, you can see it, with cork faces. And the beauty of these, unlike G cramps or the, uh, the kind of sash cramp type, is they're not that heavy. So uh, I think these are favoured by people like musical instrument makers. Uh, and of course, if you're working on something like a tall case clock, a 19th century thing, the cases are often so flimsy, you don't want a lot of metal on there. So these are made by, there's all sorts of copies, but the, the make is uh, Clemsier. Uh, Team Open Clock Club can put it on their thing. And they're, I think they're about 10 pounds, these short ones. What I would say, is if you're gonna get these, then maybe get the, the think what you're gonna use them for first, because the only difference is the length of this bit of metal here. These are 200 mil. And I got these in the UK from Axminster Tools and they were on offer about a month ago. I used to have some in the old days, but I lost them along the way. The point in portrait, do you think it's photography, but it's landscape? Oh yeah, it does, yeah. Sorry, I've just, uh, there we are. Yeah. yeah. So, so he, he thought that a drill produced an oversized hole, so the drill comes out the hole easily. How come the one mil pivot has a tight fit in a one mil hole? Uh, great question from Dave L. How come the one mil pivot, or whatever size it is you drill with, is a tight fit in the hole? It's because I make the metal a bit smaller before I start making the drill. So in this case, I stoned off 0 0.03 millimeter. Um, you're absolutely right. A drill will not make the, the size of a hole that it says on the shank. Often when you measure um, a jobber drill or a twist drill, it's actually smaller than the, you know, if you choose eighth inch or three millimeters or whatever, it's usually smaller than that. And I think that's probably for that reason, because they drill oversized. And especially these handmade uh, chaps, they drill usually well oversized because you don't always get the point in the middle. 
So if you look back last week, what I did, Dave, is I stoned off with um, oil stone about 0 0.03 millimeter first before I made the drill on the basis that the metal would then be a decent fit in the hole. Last week, it didn't work. It was sloppy as anything. This week, uh, it's worked fine. So that's that's the reason. That's how I did it. Other questions? Yeah. Um, Simon says he thought that pivot file burnished the metal rather than just removing material. Right. This uh, Simon say, Simon's asked about burnishing strut uh, removing material. This Simon is one of every week we have a, like a handful of questions that need research people throw around and i am not a metallurgist as you know and i'm not a material scientist but they throw around the whole thing about abrasion and polishing and burnishing burnishing is as i understand it plastic deformation of material now with um there's a lot of really cool uh, uh peer-reviewed academic articles online about burnishing i've looked into it because my students were always interested in this so yeah if you can redistribute that material uh, but my question would be does that act, is that actually what happens if you look at the pivot really closely um we can maybe look at some pivot files it's a really good question i can't remember what the quite on thursday we run a live stream and uh chris i think it's chris there yeah uh, chris is there chris asked a question i can't remember the question was it was either about cleaning or oiling or something one of those things that, that crop up the whole time but uh, pivot files and pivot polishing and the need for that, I don't use a pivot file uh, in my, my repair work. Maybe very, 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 very occasionally on barrel lava pivots where um, micro cold welding has led to galling, then sometimes I'll file that uh, brass off there that's stuck to the arbor, but not on regular pivots. Making, no problem. I don't use them on uh, repair work. A lot of people do. My personal experience of it is, and it's quite a controversial point, is that if you file the pivots as a kind of natural part of your practice, then you're making them smaller diameter. And yes, I know people say it's only a tiny bit, but you're making them smaller diameter. The grooves that run round the pivot that are caused by poor lubrication or contamination of lubricating oil, once that bearing's cleaned out, again, I don't have any, um, any uh, academic research to back this up, I'm afraid, but I don't use a pivot file in my repair work. And my personal experience is over 20 years that the clocks that I repair, if they do stop, uh, it's not for that reason. Um, I don't have any problem with energy getting through the train and so on. So. I think in uh, where this comes from, and again, you probably know a heck of a lot more than me, uh, you people out there, is from Watch World, where you've got a very hard pivot, a hardened steel pivot running in a jewel, which I presume from a kind of mechanical perspective is a totally different scenario from something like this, which is relatively soft material running in, I keep my finger there so it stays in focus, running in a brass hole, uh, I think that's completely different and therefore I've not used a pivot file for years, but we'll look at some in a minute because I've got loads of them somewhere and maybe we'll give a few away or a couple away next week in our tour week. So thoughts on that, please. Um, I, I don't have a problem with those grooves. If the, if the score marks or the grooves run were axial with the bearing, totally would get removing those because of course if the bearing rotated they would cause more wear or accelerated wear. But grooves that go round the bearing, I, again, personally, um, I know I'm in a minority, but I just don't have a problem with those, so I leave them as they are. Unless the pivot is, like, really mushroomed or something and has to be replaced, then, yeah. But again, if you follow our live stream on Thursday, our rusty clock, the pivots, I think, um, are what people would call really grooved. I think a lot of people would... Um, file stroke polish stroke burnish those grooves out and for me what that does it links back to our bushing question bushing is related in ex uh not inexorably what's the word uh bushing is related to uh inextricably thank you to depthing if you reduce the size of the pivots 
you change the depth thing. And depth thing normally causes a problem when mobiles move apart and they operate outside the pitch circle diameters and you get um, engaging friction. So you get more action before the line of centers. And if you reduce the size of pivots, typically you're going to make that situation worse. So I imagine any benefit that you get from an improved bearing surface is probably uh, taken away uh, with um, uh, the debt thing thing. But anyway, enough of that rant for the time being, that question will go on forever and keep your thoughts coming on it because that's what we're here for, to kind of share ideas. So I finished this pivot uh, down to about 0 0.72 and then finished it with the uh, Spyderco ceramic stone. So happy with that. Let's just have a quick uh, measure up and then probably get rid of the lathe. And if I can find my caliper, easier said than done. Let's just have a new bit of paper to make it look smart. There we are. And here's our frame. We're aiming for uh, about 0.7 millimeters, maybe a little bit larger. And again, hopefully we don't have to push. If it's a bit bigger, you could broach out the hole a little bit, I suppose, which is not ideal. Um, but there you go. So let's just. So we've got slightly under um, 0.7 on our non-repivoted end. And we've got, oh, same on the other end. So I've actually, <laughs> I've actually gone a little bit undersized from where I thought I would do, but that's kind of worked out well because it's just similar, not the same as the other end. So let's try the mobile in the frame. Uh, which way around does it go? Centre wheel goes on there, it must go that way around. So the first thing, uh, talking about adapting and bushing, this whole uh, thing about uprighting. So uh, going off piste as always, when you've, oh, by the way, uh, I always say this every week, normally I'd wear um, nitrile gloves when handling uh, historic work like this all the time, disassembly or reassembly. I don't hear because it's just not practical with the camera and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I strongly advise you to. Um, so uprighting, that's the perpendicular nature of the arbor in relation to uh, the plate. And what's important here is not the amount of wiggle per se. There's a kind of rule of thumb and rule of thumb, rules of thumb are always great, but they're also dangerous things as well, is that you have about five degrees included angle. I think it's an included angle, so that's two and a half degrees from perpendicular. But of course, that doesn't mean a thing if the pivot hole in the other side of the frame is uh, not perpendicular to the first pivot hole. Now, a clock like this that was made on a machine with jigs and things, then you're pretty sure that the other pivot is directly opposite of pretty much the, um, the arbor. But if you look at, shouldn't really leave the arbor sticking out. If you look at this clock, yeah, and we'll just move to photo like that, you may be able to see that the wheels are crazy all over the place. That wheel is, this is how the clock came to us. It's um, like as far off perpendicular as you can almost get. So you've got to be a little bit careful about that rule of thumb thing. What's, in, what's important is there is side shake in relation to that perpendicular position. And remember that's in both planes. Now this is a little bit wobbly in the hole maybe, um, but let's just have a look at it when the other plate's on. So I can remember how this clock's got together. Yeah, 
Right, okay. So here we've got our new pivot on this end and our old pivot on this end. So when you've done your bushing, um, if you've done depthing and you've got a problem with depthing and so you've decided to bush or rebush a hole to develop a more optimal uh, center distance, then uh, your final check, uh, I might as well show you this while I'm here, if I can find my pointy stick. And this is really, really critical. Often uh, with a lot of rebushing, what you tend to find is the clock seems to run fine at the beginning. And then after a few weeks, your client rings you up and say that clock that you repaired, it stopped now uh, because the bearing has picked up because either there's a shoulder there on the pivot or the hole was too tight. So the, the, the first test is to, can't really show it horizontal here, but just test, I if you can hear, um, dial up and dial down that that arbor drops. In fact, when you turn the frame over, you maybe can't hear it there, but it, you can feel it dropping from one shoulder to the other. It has to do that at this point. Any reticence, if you've rebushed here um, for a depthing issue, any reticence there will bite you eventually. It might not be straight away, that's the problem. It may take a few weeks or even months before the bearing begins to pick up. The second thing is just to give it a spin and check that it comes to a reasonably comfortable stop. Now that's the old uh, pivot there. I mean, it's not like a marine chronometer, but it's, doesn't seem to be tight, still loose. And on the side that I've done, now my um, slight problem with that is, as I, as I said before, and a couple of weeks ago, I really wanted to retain the original, quite sort of rough turned shoulder of the pivot, and I haven't, I've turned it off. Um, so this side is now quite a lot smoother than it was before, which slightly irritates me, but uh, that's just one of those things. So there we go. We've got end shake and we've got side shake. We won't go down the bushing and depthing line now, otherwise we're going to get completely carried off course. Um, so good. At last, we've got our pivot done. Just one thing is that this shoulder, as you can, as you can see there, the original shoulder pivot, it does stick out past the plate. It's about two mil. You see that? If you look at my end, it's a little bit longer. In fact, even when they have as a cross through, um, you might argue, it doesn't bother me, but that pivot is about quarter of a millimeter too long. So maybe I put it back in the lathe and uh, turn it down a bit. But I suppose what's important maybe, or more important is end shake. So if I can just find another wheel from the clock. Um, <clears throat> Let's just have a look at how re-pivoting that arbor has affected end shake on the basis that they were all the same when they came out of the factory, which of course we don't really know. So that's 36.9, 36.92. My mental mass is hopeless as you know. And this one, I've not measured it, so this might be horrific, is 36.82. So given that the arbors were the same length shoulder to shoulder when the clock was new, we don't know, but let's say it was, we've lost, or I've lost 0.1 uh, of a mil um, through repivoting, which is probably okay, it's not ideal. Um, you would want to keep that shoulder to shoulder distance. Obviously that gets to be a lot, or you, the arbor's broken or something. And this is what we've got with our live stream clock. You often see, or sometimes see that the arbor is shortened and there's an extended bush put on the inside of the plate, which again, this issue of other people's work, um, and I know it's going to maybe be quite controversial when we come to that Thursday issue with the clock, but we had a little look at it on Thursday. Please join us, by the way, Thursday, six o'clock uh, BST for our next live stream. Is that the pivot that's been turned on the arbor looks fine to me and the extended bush uh, may be seen by some people as ugly, but it is or appears to be sound. We haven't washed the clock yet, so we don't know. So there we go. Uh, we've finally got the pivot on. Thank you for bearing with me. It was a bit of a, a marathon, but we got there in the end. And it's time 
Unless there are any more questions. Um, I've got a picture of a waste paper basket. Um, oh, thank you. And it's um, it's a basket. Yeah, that's right. Not a bin. Well done, Derek. Um, because I really like those um, red and metal constructed uh, baskets and the local council here, not council bashing, by the way, we love our local council, but there doesn't seem to be any kind of um, dis, uh, any thought gone into replacing those baskets with the new plastic ones, which I think is a bit of a shame. And they, some of them were made by one of those companies in Birmingham, in Birmingham, England, that made diesel engines, like Perkins or something like that, I forget now. Uh, that one's outside Pocklington School in East Yorkshire, and I was just so pleased to see it there that it hasn't been torn up and chucked away, so kept it. Right, uh, I think it's maybe, can't quite see my clock on there, is it 37, 27, 37. Let's have, uh, we haven't had a comfort break last week. Let's have a couple of minutes comfort break because that's something that seems to have completely gone by the wayside. So 37 and a half, let's meet back at uh, 1640 and we will pursue the rogue tooth. So bye for now. I'll just mute. Okay, welcome back. Little break at there. Uh, before I forget again, we're starting um, a series of short talks with uh, ICON in this country. That's the Institute of Conservation. So the broad equivalent to I, um, AIC in the States. Um, there's Australian version and a European version as well. Um, so it's the professional conservation body and we've got together six speakers, including uh, Jonathan Betts, who is the advisor to the National Trust, Keith Scobie Youngs, who basically repairs the majority of the uh, turret clock, and uh, not, not turret clocks, but famous turret clocks in this country, like Hampton Court Palace, a couple of alumni of mine, and uh, a guy called Seth Kennedy, who's um, a watchmaker, who's gonna talk about dueling. Anyway, 
uh, we are going to do 10 minute talks, just an introduction to the group, kind of dynamic objects conservation group. We're going to put the link to that in the description for this video. And if you and in the live chat, yeah, in the live chat as well. It's like this group, it's free to attend, open to all. It'd be lovely to see you there. It's on Monday at uh, Monday the 12th at six o'clock. Okay, um, right. So two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we talked about refacing pallets. Uh, that was, um, I can't remember who asked for it, but uh, we did it. And what we did here, we've got some spiders webs on it. Let's just move this backwards. What we did was, as you can see, if I can find my pointy stick, which I can't, there it is, is we refaced the entry pallet here. Just about to see there, look, we put a new piece of hardened and tempered uh, steel on it to reduce drop. And because the other pallet had already been refaced, we just did one. Sometimes you can get away with just doing one. And doing that one, we managed to reduce both external and internal drop. Uh, we can talk about that again. But if you go back through these videos, we already explain it. So we soldered that on, hardened it, temp hardened it, soldered it on. And then with a diamond file, we cut back the exit corner of the entry pallet to develop our internal drop. And everything was um, honky dory. Let's go, let's go the actual right direction. So you can see here, now the active tooth is resting on the entry pallet. It's impulsing the pendulum, which doesn't exist. And it's gonna drop off and land on the exit pallet. See that? Let's just go back and do that again. So the active tooth is on the entry pallet. It's gonna leave the entry pallet, uh, I suppose in watch work, you'd call that discharging corner or something. And you can see the little gap there on between the incoming tooth, next active tooth and the exit pallet. There's our drop, nice and small. And then we've got the acting tooth on the exit pallet and gonna land on the entry pallet like that. External drop, all good, happy, everybody's happy. But of course, life's never that easy because as we work around the, um, should really get some tweezers and get that bit of fur off there. Anyway, not to worry. Uh, we've got a bit of drop, not quite even, but we won't worry about that. And we work around the wheel. And then eventually, or at least it was doing two, oh, there we are. It, you probably didn't see that, but it just caught. So a little bit, too little internal drop. And then just on that corner of the entry pallet, it's catching. Maybe you can't, you can certainly feel it and hear it. And if we go to the next tooth, a bit more, same. And then that one's actually jamming. So the clock refuses to run. So broadly there, we've got, we haven't got enough internal drop. So let's take it apart and put those two components in the depthing tool so we can have a closer look. Now you certainly um, should get a screwdriver really. I'll get a screwdriver. Those nice what? Clamps. Yeah, Where did you get them from? Axminster Tools. Okay. They were on offer a few weeks ago. Three, you bought three or something. See. Now, if um, we talked about this a bit on Thursday, but this fat cock, look, uh, beautifully finished underneath, really nice. Oh, we've got a whopping great big bush in there. Um, isn't uh, steady pinned, um, which is kind of could be really useful for, for us. Uh, those of you that have worked on this Enfield or bought the book, you'll know that you can actually adjust internal and external drop on those clocks. Uh, we explain it in a chapter on the escapement by moving the center distance, by sliding the back cock and the front pallet arbor pivot up and down. You can't do that here. If we had a problem with that external drop, because the pallets are basically arranged at a right angle, changing the center distance changes external drop a lot. 
but it has very little, if any, effect on internal drop. And that's where our problem is. So moving the back cock up and down isn't going to help us here. Um, let's just get the color arbor out. We've got time. We'll come back to this plate because, as you can see, it's had all sorts of um, things done to it in terms of bushing and stuff like that. Uh, but anyway, let's um, just deal with this escapement. Now, I always uh, have used my beloved polymorph here to make um, a stand for my depth in tool so it doesn't keep falling over. Uh, that way around, I think. I always forget how this goes together. Um, lots of talk about depthing tools in the Facebook group, which is great. One of our Facebook members had a depthing tool with a kind of little finger on, a spring-loaded finger, which was brilliant for the job that we're going to do, checking the trueness and concentricity of, uh, of work. This one doesn't. This one is by um, Malcolm Wilde of Sheffield. And I think he's just about still making them. There are a lot of money, but of course it's a, it's a tool that lasts forever as long as you don't drop it on the floor. So our question now is, do we have one or two rogue teeth? Um, or is there something kind of more fundamental uh, at play here? If it's one or two row teeth, then they might be bent and we can straighten and we can make a little gauge, which we're going to do in a minute. We don't run out of time. Um, or it could be that our wheel is mounted eccentrically. So with the wheel, of course, there are at least three things I can think of that could be problematic. One is that it's mounted eccentrically. And of course, we see here the giveaway that it might be mounted eccentrically because it's been recolleted. It's got a modern or a later collet. So that kind of sets a bit of an alarm bell uh, ringing, but you know, let's not judge it yet. The next thing is that the wheel might be slightly unevenly divided. This clock's 200 years old. If it is, then we just kind of have to shrug our shoulders. It could also be that the teeth are bent. Now remember that what we're talking about here, which is drop or lack of it, is the function of two teeth. That the active tooth moves from one uh, palate to the other, effectively one tooth, but let's think of it as two. So those teeth might be slightly too far apart, um, but we've got to figure out which two teeth uh, it is, because when we're thinking about internal drop, then it's the tooth that's just dropped off the entry palate. That kind of makes sense. Um, so it could be the wheel might be oval or not round, it might be eccentrically mounted, the teeth might be bent, it might be unevenly divided. So there's quite a lot of factors that we have to consider when we're thinking about what our treatment's going to be, if any. Now, I know I, can, I can't see the live chat, but you're all shouting, Matthew, why don't you just file some more off your new bit of metal that you sold it on? Because presumably it worked before. We could do that. That might, that's certainly an option to us. But of course, we know that at least 15, we counted then teeth work, which coincidentally is probably about half the teeth that are on the wheel. Um, so if we increase that internal drop, fine, it'll work. But for the other 15 teeth that work in fine before, we'll have more drop and the clock will sound like it's running in and out of beat, which again, drives some people crazy, uh, but you just have to live with it. So I'm going to use the, um, I've probably put this in the wrong way around, depth in tool to one complete tooth, too many engaged.
too few engaged. Does this tool check the top of the two for the name and where is one of those? Yeah, this, this tool is not normally used for this purpose. This is kind of an add-on um, sort of benefit for it, but it's called a depthing tool. And it's an, well, it's, it's easy to say it's an, an essential tool, but they can be quite expensive. It's not actually an essential tool, but it's an incredibly useful tool when you're checking the mesh of wheels. So this whole subject of depthing and bushing, and I'm really happy to come back to it in subsequent weeks to cover it for new members. Um, you have to, if you've got a problem with the meshing of wheels or mobiles as they're called, you, you can test them in the clock zone frame. And that's how we do it for 99% of the time or 90% of the time. But sometimes you wanna take them out of the frame, it's easier to see, and you want to test them outside the range of what's available in the frame by pressing them together or moving them apart. And so we use this tool, it's called a depthing tool. And um, it's, yeah, not essential, but incredibly useful. Right, let me just get this. So if you're um, unfamiliar with the tool, what it enables you to do is to, let's see, can you, is to change the center distance. So the amount of engagement between the two components. Should have actually practiced this, which would have helped, but uh, never stopped me before. Right, okay. So maybe not great with the camera angle, I'll just try and move it a little bit. So hopefully you can see now, just about, let's just check the wheel the whole way around. Now it's still hanging up, even though, just go backwards. Even though in that position, we've got lots and lots and lots of drop. If we reduce by moving the centers a bit close together, if we reduce external drop, very slowly bringing those centers together. See there, it's jamming on the entry pallet. So a lack of internal drop there. Let's just go back and count how many teeth are problematic. So half, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 17. Um, that tells me that the, um, it, it appears that half the wheel is okay with the amount of drop we've got and half of it isn't. So that tells me that I, my first place to look wouldn't be a rogue tooth. So one or maybe two or three teeth that are bent. It tells me that this wheel is um, probably either ovalized, um, so-called poorly divided from manufacture, which we just have to live with it, or um, it's uh, eccentrically mounted, which I think, again, going back to that collet is probably our problem. So let's just give it a little spin and have a look. 
Um, it doesn't look crazy. It's not perfect. It doesn't look crazy bad. Again, we could do with maybe in the lathe, it would be a bit better than you could put something at the T-rest or um, a bit of wire as an indicator against the edge of the wheel and see what the sort of run out um, is there. It doesn't look too bad. tight now um, and now what we can do we can hopefully just move that runner across and close this up if it'll close up far enough yeah that's that's good actually oh actually now i can see Let's just get the camera a wee bit closer if we can. No, I, I, you're absolutely right, Derek. Um, I don't know if you can see the gap there. That's just, but um, between the wheel and the runner, just as a guide, where well, you can see yeah, it's touching on about a third of the teeth and then not on two thirds of the teeth. So this isn't just one or two rogue teeth that's causing our problem. So here we have a fork in the road, as always with our decision-making process. And it's the decision-making process, of course, that is much more than half the battle. The mechanical skills and having the tools and the time and the patience and building all that will come with time. The difficult bit in all this is making that decision and thinking, why are we doing it? What is it gonna to mean to the object? How does that tie in with our customer, our stakeholders or whatever? Um, this work is a cost benefit exercise in the widest sense of cost. And um, how is that gonna pan out? And those decisions, of course, obviously there's no right or wrong decision to it. You just have to make a decision um, and agree broadly where you're gonna go and then work towards that point. And it might be that something else will crop up along the way. And you think actually, we made this decision, but now we realize this thing's happened and therefore we have to kind of move our target, if you like. So that's the critical part. John uh, says, uh, let's re it. John says, let's re it. Right. Uh, was that our John? Yeah. Oh, uh, oh. Sure. right. Okay. <laughs> well, we can re it. Uh, many people here are beginners and they probably don't have uh, a big lathe or a lathe to do this work. I've got a watchmaker's lathe, as you've seen here, um, working from home, which is great, love it. But um, if you've got a Shaoblin 102 or a Shaoblin 70 with collets or something like that, mid-sized lathe, great. You can put it in the lathe, turn it, use your graver to do the undercut and uh, we're away to go. For beginners, that is slightly more problematic. Maybe that's not even an option. So if we didn't have that, uh, 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 equipment or skill or um, ability to learn that just at this point, then maybe you would increase internal drop. And what I mean by that is this face here, as you can see, this is new that I sold it on and we adjusted it by cutting back and back and back here. So as Derek was, it said, this is tiny, relatively tiny values. If we cut this back probably 0.1 of a mil, millimeter, it would work and our problems would be over. But of course, we're here to explore options. So recolleting seems to be getting the vote. Um, we love a vote, don't we? Uh, Open Clock Club says we love a vote. Uh, so um, what I'm doing here, by the way, is uh, st I'm still on the rogue tooth um, issue. I'm going to make a gauge. So if you were engaged with the rogue tooth, because we've probably about run out of time, must get myself a clock. Oh, we have run out of time. Um, we would make, but I'll do this for next week. I'll do this next week. Make a little gauge that fits in there out of a bit of scrap brass. And what you can do with that gauge is you can say, well, I think this tooth, this tooth, and this tooth are kind of okay. 
and then you can try it in all the others and use it as a kind of um you can see here look i don't think i put that mark on it so somebody's probably already struggled with this clock so i won't do it tonight because we're out of time but i'm going to file up uh this to make a little rogue tooth uh gauge and we will begin next week um with uh with continuing with this project sorry with continuing with this project but there are a couple of things that we haven't got around to tonight as always so much to talk about let's come back to this um plate here with this uh soft shouldered bush in it and let's kick that about a bit uh this has got depth thing marks on it as a lot of clocks have but they don't look to me to be manufacturers depth thing marks um interesting that the plate it's got these kind of cracks in it and things um 200 years old non uh homogenous material a bush here that's been riveted in as i said on oh, one that's been hammered up here so all cool stuff to discuss those things as i said many times don't bother me one bit as long as they're sound they're not going to damage the clock they're not going to damage the uh the the person that's winding it or owning it yeah we've got everything here look we've got a solid bush a plugged hole, a hammered up thing, and a little uh, kind of sleeve that's put inside another bush. So um, everything to play for there. So we'll come back to that next week. And also I forgot to talk about pivot files in depth, but we've got them somewhere here. I've lost them. Anyway, uh, let's talk about pivot files as well next week. So plenty of things on our list. In the meantime, please head over to Facebook and help our community or ask questions and we'll try and help you to develop in clock making. Don't forget to sign up for the ICON event on the 12th of April. And if you're around on Thursday night, why don't you drop by and see us for our live stream. So we all done? Yeah, we're gonna keep the live chat uh, open just for a couple of minutes or something so we can all say goodbye. And thank you so much. And as always, thank you for the live chat. And thank you to Team Open Clock Club here for keeping the show on the road. Lots of ground covered, a little bit chaotic as always. And thank you very much. Have a great week and we'll see you next week.